Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear us. Uh, welcome to panel three. Uh, before I introduce myself and ourselves, we'll talk a little bit about what the panel's about and just what to expect in the next hour. Um, I'm glad you've had your coffees. Following us is lunch, so just so on that. Um, there are no videos, it's, it's just us, and actually, so we're all in, in the room, and we have, of course, folks joining us online, and we'd like to give them a chance to also ask questions um, as, as well. So our panel, I think our most important part, these are post-pandemic, by the way, this, this vision, um, is about the realities of doing practice research in design. So we're bringing together these wonderful people, with very different perspectives of doing practice research and design in relation to social and sustainability issues. And there are doctoral students, they're early career researchers, some of us supervisors, we all come from different sort of pathways, I'd say, in our different stages in our research. Um, we don't pretend to know everything. We're speaking from our practices and our research um, and our insights from doing that about the challenges and opportunities that, that we've faced. Um, we're in Chelsea College of Art and Design, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that when we're talking about design practice and research, we're talking about it in an art school context, and I find that quite exciting because our university talks about creative practice, having purpose, something the panel spoke about the last time. So we'd like to touch on what that might mean for some of us um, as we're doing this. There was a mention about research not as an elite activity. We're an academic institution, but many of us are actually engaging with students at undergraduate level and postgraduate level and pre um, and foundation level as, as well. And I just want to remind us of Arjuna Padurai, who spoke about research not as an elite activity, but as a fundamental human right, as curiosity that helps us engage with the world and empower us. Um, so perhaps some of that will come up. We're also conscious that as for, you know, five of us, I have to count better, um, is that there are many people who we have engaged with who are not in the room today, our students, but also the communities who are outside of the university. So our challenge for us is really how we can actually respectfully um, represent them when we, when we share uh, our thoughts with you. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll, we'll move and we're gonna use a little question to, to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm gonna start with Rosie Hornbuckle, who's a senior researcher at the Center of Circular Design at Chelsea College of Art and Service Futures Lab at the London College of Communication. Rosie, can you give us one example where doing practice research made you felt like it was working um, or joyful or maybe even exhilarating? Thank you, Rathna, <clears throat> and thank you also um, to um, uh, the Social Design Institute for inviting me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context first, context first about what my practice is about. Um, and I want to thank you, the previous panel for having cleared up quite a lot about um, <laughs> we don't have to address practice or research or design as separate. Um, it's brilliant. Um, so my practice is about responding to the challenge of complex multidisciplinary collaborations. It's about firstly problematizing collaboration and then using design process methods and sensibilities to develop and introduce things or moments which can support the flow of different types of knowledge within a particular frame. My research is about what happens and how, what is the role of design in mobilizing knowledge to support understanding. That could be a talk series that focuses on individual expertise rather than tasks and deliverables. It could be a workshop, it could be a prototyping um, scenarios or prototyping artifacts, narratives, journeys. Most importantly, it's about the prioritization of collaborative methodologies in the funding grant, allowing all partners to take ownership over how they collaborate and see it as part of everyone's project. The complexity in these collaborations comes from trying to involve a system level collaboration, but design can enable partners to time travel, to scale between different object level, human and organizational and system levels. So in a way, I'm kind of challenged that previous sort of suggestion that systems design is not about materials and making as well. I think there's the potential for design to help sort of transverse those different scales um, from systems to, to, to object oriented um, perspectives. 
um, and then therefore to enable system level change. Um, and I think that design can also introduce methods to help critique the assumptions behind that different system framings. Um, so to answer your question specifically, I think that um, the types of things that I introduce in terms of practice, um, when, when I kind of get quite excited, is when something that I've done has enabled someone to, to realise or recognise a change in themselves. So, for example, um, when we've done sort of road mapping um, with scientists and they kind of, they, they kind of go, oh, that, this is something that I've not ever been able to articulate or visualise in a way that enables me to communicate with someone else. Or, for example, with pharmacists, when we've enabled them to understand how their ecosystem um, gives them a sense of understanding of what their role is within their, within their job and how important it actually is as a relational um, uh, sort of role. So, yeah, it's, it's always going to be about those, th those times when people kind of, um, what you've done has enabled them to feel like they can give them agency and enable them to do something. Um, but also it, the recognition from, um, that we increasingly have with, with, um, with um, fund people who are sort of developing funding in other sectors that they really need design and they really, when we explain what we can do for them or with them, they kind of um, really appreciate that that's something that they value and that they now need in order to transition and change um, through their funding, research funding. Thank you, Rosie. You got us off to a, a great start. Uh, Tom, if I'm going to move, move to you. You're an associate professor. You've co-founded the Social Design Unit at the University of Southern Denmark. And the unit has carried out several social design projects, you know, in the Danish public sector with the prison and probation service. And I'm, we're quite interested in how you speak about design as a political and critical, but aesthetic practice. What are your thoughts on my question to you? I think it might be, uh, thanks, thanks for, for inviting me to, to talk about that. Um, I might uh, prefer to take an example from our uh, own uh, research project. And you said design allows us to travel back in time or make time travels. I would like to invite you all to go back five uh, years in time. We are sitting in, me and my research unit is sitting in a Danish maximum security prison in a visiting room together with a, a prisoner father. He's convicted for seven, 17 years for setting up a meth lab. He's having his son visiting him. We're sitting together with them. We are bringing in a game, a board game we have designed for over two years together with the prisoner, fathers, the children, family therapists, psychologists, criminologists, and so on. And we're quite eager to understand whether the game can actually enable the father and his son to reestablish family storytelling, which is quite hard when you're separated so much from each other. And we are making a participatory observation study. We are facilitating the game. We're also playing the game with him. Uh, as we go along, the game is like a monopoly-like structure, so we move inside a a uh, game world is a kind of a, a prison where the, the children learn what is actually the daily routines in a Danish prison. But it also has certain elements like Christian cards, which in, entice the players to, con to make a conversation around issues that can be a bit hard to talk about. So the father at a certain point picks up a Christian cards, which uh, tells him, now you have to be honest with your son. We have, we have made, crafted the cards carefully with psychologists. And he said, well, I can be honest. Um, having said that, the son says immediately, I don't want to listen to it. OK, he just sort of ignores it, continues to say, when I'm actually, I'm dreaming about when I get out of jail, I'll be the best father ever. And while he's saying that, his son is sort of sticking his fingers into his ears, blocking out sound. And, um, and we sort of, it sort of it still sits with us, this situation. Because I think it's kind of a very good uh, example, I would call it an anecdote, uh, in the sense of Mike Michaels, because it says quite a lot about what it means to do social design and the messiness of doing so. I mean, you, you asked uh, before what is successful. I won't call it successful, successful as such, but it, it, it generates a lot of questions that we need to be aware about. Aesthetically, we have crafted a game. The game sort of forces a child into a position he doesn't want to be in. So it has a certain agency. It also uh, sort of um, provokes us as researchers to think more carefully what it means to, to strive to do good. Because obviously we were trying to do this project for the benefit of prisoner fathers and son. But that's, why, that's because we were working together with the Danish Prison and Probation Service which has invited us saying, well, we have, a, we have a problem with our visiting program for teenage sons and daughters. They don't have meaningful activities, okay? 
why not design a board game? And the, the Danish Prison Information Service has a very political agenda that they believe that family storytelling is good in itself. Well, this question, we need to question that assumption while doing the game, also tapping into the organization and disturbing that kind of a mindset, saying, well, it's, it's not always the case, perhaps. And, you know, so it's a balance between finding yourself doing an aesthetic practice of designing a game while also having to navigate through some political kind of agendas. So that's, that's my answer to that question. So it's also an exhilarating challenge that we get to resolve. Um, what do you say here? Um, you're an architect and a social designer focused on resilience and sustainability. And actually, you're based in Budapest, um, where you facilitated both social, ecological, and humanitarian design projects with underprivileged communities. What would your take be on the question about practice research and where it has worked for you or brought a sense of exhilaration or joy? Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Um, this very exciting uh, conversations and taking part, it, part in it. Um, I'm coming from the Mohoina University of Art and Design in Budapest, and I do a lot of field work. And uh, it is the most exciting for me, in most cases, when I do projects collaboratively with people, um, and even when I do synthesis and I do research parts of, uh, in my desk, that's the most amazing part that gives fuel to me. And uh, my work is mostly focusing on uh, rural uh, situations in the northeast part of Hungary or the southeast, uh, far from big cities, uh, where I'm looking at uh, the opportunities of resilience building amongst disadvantaged communities. These are mostly children communities I work with. Um, and mostly Roma communities, and um, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm trying mostly uh, focus on uh, creativity development and what design can do in that realm um, by, by creating, co-creating uh, and using design methods um, in our processes. Um, it is also wonderful to see the impact, um, wh what we have, and, uh, and, and what we don't have and see uh, and how we challenge assumptions in regard to that um, and see the, the, the results of these experiential processes uh, we endeavor uh, in these situations, in the exact situations uh, with the exact communities. I think it's very important. Um, once uh, through a participatory design process, uh, we, we co-created a bench at a tiny village in, in Bodvasilas, in the northeast of Hungary, um, where segregation between the Roma and non-Roma population is very tangible. Um, and with the children, we, 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 we co-designed and created a bench. Uh, it's a, it's a tower-like uh, bench that, that, that can sit around 15 people together <laughs> and we placed it um, in conversation with a lot of stakeholders in the village at the center of the village. And it's still there. And they still use it. And, and f for me, um, it meant that the process, how we did it, and the value that it was created was meaningful. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's exhilarating, actually. Hannah, I'm going to come to you uh, last. And you're our acting course leader on the MA Service Design course at LCC. You're also affiliated with the Service Futures Lab at LCC. And you're both based in the UK and in Pakistan. Um, I believe you practice led doctorate. Um, in graphic communication design for sustainable social innovation was a sort of place where you brought practice and research together um, and sort of fed to where you are now. What are your thoughts? Uh, thank you so much, um, Ratna. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a question that I've been thinking about since we, we've had a chat about this panel. But first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Social Design Institution for putting such an amazing event together. It's so good to see you all uh, being in person here. Um, uh, thinking about the question, uh, I've, I just kind of, it just kind of took me back on a, on a journey down the memory lane. 
uh, for me personally, my uh, practice research journey started with the PhD. Uh, I came from a totally practice-based uh, background in advertising and uh, branding. So, um, and for me, I think it was a space that I very consciously engaged with, social design, but I had no idea how to go about it, hence the PhD. Uh, before I get into my background, working in two completely different contexts, the uh, Global North and the Global South, I'd just like to kind of point out that I think for me, um, the idea of practice research um, became very clear um, in what it means to me or my own practice uh, early on due to um, a, a supervisory team during my PhD, which was practice-based and research theory-oriented. So that was, I would, I would say I was, not, um, I was not supervised, I was kind of nurtured through the process which was very important um, as what I am today and how I engage my practice. So coming back to Ratna's question, I'm gonna keep, keep to time. Um, my background is uh, design and social science. So I come from a design background, graphic communication design and social science mass communication. I've got an MSc in mass communication, which I sometimes forget. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a very important part of my practice, um, I as I understand it. I work with communities, local communities here in the UK and in Pakistan, and I work with underprivileged communities and with the public sector in both the contexts. Um, my primary mode of design when working with communities is participatory design. Uh, in, in both the context, which means I use part participatorial methods to research, to map, to scope, to define, to develop, to implement, to evaluate. Um, at each stage, design stage, I try to engage um, people that I'm working with um, in terms of my design ambitions. So for me, I think what, what this means is that I, my own practice research uh, makes me question um, how I'm engaging with the process in terms of, uh, of the outcomes or, or the methods in itself. I'm constantly questioning myself that um, what, what I'm doing, is it in inclusive? Is it equitable? Uh, what is my role in, in this uh, process? What is the role of people I'm engaging with, my stakeholders in the process? How is the knowledge being ex exchanged? How is the knowledge being created? How is the knowledge being shared? So these are the kind of questions that are at the foremost of uh, my own practice um, with each project. Um, uh, so, for example, when I'm working with low literacy communities in Pakistan, I design tools, lots of tools, um, that are primarily visual-based and that focus on um, effective communication, I feel is the first step towards sustainability, effective communication. We need to get across and get things right. Um, and also to a map design context. So additionally, it's, it's what, what it helps me develop is a common vocabulary something that makes us understand each other, that brings clarity in what the re research aims and objectives are, so we're on the same plane. And then also sustainability, because uh, one of the most important things in social design research and my own practice is that once thinking about what happens to the context when the designer leaves the context. So what, what, how, how is sustainability designed within the uh, objective of the research project or the design project? So just very quickly finishing off. So for me, I think it's practice-based research is not about designing an artifact or an outcome or a process or a method or a tool. I think it's about designing human experience. It's about designing and building relationships. I think it's about the most important thing. Um, it's about emotional connections. So I think it's a two-way street not a bottom-up or a top-down approach. For me, I think it's not about sharing of power. I think it's about handing over power, and it's about building trust with the communities that, that we're working with. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna to have to top that now with the next set of like questions, but I think a couple of things there about feeling like outsiders, I think, and being quite um, sensitive to that and that engagement using creative practice and research as pathways to that engagement um, while ensuring a sort of ethical engagement and some boundaries there that become quite sensitive. 
I think perhaps uh, some dialogue that's quite interesting between research and practice that, that you're both engaging in and, and it looks like creative practice learning from research and research learning learning from, from practice. And perhaps some something about that the humanist practice to talk about Sylvia Winter, this idea about the exhilaration comes from a connection and engagement. And that's really humbling that you can have an impact, that you can have change, that you could be of service, perhaps is, is, is in all of the world. Um, which sort of leads me, because you've, you've built that up, is, is to say what can be then achieved through practice research that can't be achieved as effectively through, through other forms of, of research. Um, Henna, can I start with you on, on, on this one? I think, Ratna, I think just uh, for me, it's, it's always, I think that the whole concept starts from when we, we start planning um, a, a research project or a practice um, uh, based idea where we're thinking about, okay, so how do we engage, what do we need to do? So I think my, for me, my, my key resource is the context. So, so the primary objectives of doing research kind of um, weave a path of how to take this forward. But I think as designers, um, uh, we, we constantly, and excuse me for generalizing, uh, but I think we, we kind of, when we're planning, we work with the, and for me, I think it's in this order, that we work with the plausible, we work with the possible, and, uh, and then we work with the probable. So I think the idea of um, creating this space um, and understanding the value of the tacit for me is the key to within my own practice. So we, we talk about social design and we talk about behavior change, but I was just listening to um, uh, Rachel's, um, uh, and she's going to be talking today as well, Rachel Cooper's podcast the other day, and she talked about values of value. So what, what are the values that we're engaging with? What are the values that we bring to the table? And what are the values the communities uh, bring to the table? And how do we interact? How do we uh, navigate those? So for me, I think um, the, 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 the most important thing for me within my own practice research is understanding the value of the tacit. Um, the tangibles are important, but to, to create an experience or to develop an experience, what are the tacit um, influences that are impacting it? And another thing that import, that's important for me as, as a point is um, the design context as it becomes the primary research tool. We as designers respond to context. And number three is and the tangibility and materiality of the design outcomes. That for me is important only in terms of sharing it. So how do we share it? balance between process-oriented and outcome-oriented in our approach. Thomas, I saw you nodding, so I'd like to go to you next, please. Yeah, well, I think it's um, the, the two previous panels have made it clear that when we ask ourselves what can be achieved so effectively in practice research, uh, the, that depends on what idea of practice research are you buying into, and clearly that's a pluralistic uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many different ideas of practice research. I mean, just in design research, I could come up with like a handful, uh, constructive design research, research through design, experimental design research. In Montreal, they talk about creative research, research creation. Um, and every time it means a different thing. And it also uh, varies depending on the institutional setting. So some years ago, there was a book coming out called Constructive Design Research by Ilpo Koskin and John Zimmerman and others. And they actually mapped um, practice research in different institutional settings. So you had the lab, I think we have heard about that today. Mm -hmm. They had the field being more oriented towards participatory design and ethnography, and you also had showroom or galleries being more shaped around art and humanities. They also, I think in a previous article to the book had a subtitle called Beyond, because clearly you can see <laughs> in each of those contexts, they, these are molded on already established disciplines and sciences. Mm -hmm. And we are a bit more curious to know what happens when you move beyond that, when you go into the studio, or if you actually do practice as a design researcher. 
And I think there are some very good work to, to lean on, and it has to do with acknowledging that experiment, the exi design experiment is pivotal to how we not only produce knowledge, but also produce change. And that's the, the, the second complication is when you take practice research and put it into social design, because it's not only about then co-production of knowledge, we're actually also having actions to change stuff. Um, in the setting with the prison, uh, we wanted clearly to improve relationships uh, between uh, a population and families. Uh, and a lot of time in our projects, I think we leave behind, as you say, a lot of traces, we call it ripple effects. Not all of it enters into the publications because journals and uh, book edit edited volumes are very interested in methodologies, theory construction, whereas we still struggle to perhaps account for the value we create for communities or organizations. So uh, I think it varies pretty much with what you, what you mean by also practice and research. And I, I think my time is almost up, but, but I could reference also the evolution of, of, of practice research in Denmark. I mean, we have almost two phases. Uh, starting in the beginning of 2000, um, there was this idea that art and design schools should be accredited as research institutions. And what happened was there was a heated debate. You had almost two camps. So the one camp was saying, well, you, we don't want to educate academic tailors or suing sociologists. Or <laughs> um, so what should, be the, what should be the research outcome of that practice? Uh, and, and that camp would say, well, look at my design work. It's exhibited over there. You can go and have a look. That's the knowledge I produced. Uh, whereas the other uh, camp said, well, if you do that, you have a risk of doing what happen happens in the art world. Uh, the artist leaves the art uh, interpretation to the art critic, some from, from the art side. Uh, and they were sort of insisting, well, it should be the design practitioners themselves who should account for the knowledge that is gained through that process of practice. And that was the model we, we ended up with in, in Denmark uh, in the PhD uh, you're, school. You're reminding me, I think, Thomas, of, of some of the conversations um, had the, had the pleasure of working with uh, PhD students in the National Institute of Design. And something that Indian design research has been struggling with is, of course, when knowledge was first presented, you know, pre-colonial knowledge, then you have a colonial dismissal of all of that pre-colonial knowledge. So what is discipline then? And is that a, formulated in, in a certain context? And you're bringing up pluralistic approaches. We are also talking about who are we including then in our research or in our practice and who are we excluding um, and what responsibilities do we as researchers have or people in, in the room in, in, that, uh, in that journey that we're taking, not just singularly, but, but collectively as a group coming together. Bori, could I move to you? Sure. Um, so um, let me just zoom in because I don't see what I wrote. Huh? <laughs> That's the second. So uh, when I looked at your question, <clears throat> I, I was really happy to see that. Um, and I would like to change it a little bit because I, I think it's very interesting what research can give to design um, and, and to practice. Um, and, and I think this is the reason what I, why I'm doing practice research and not just uh, practice because I think uh, practice needs a lot of research and uh, especially um, in these decades uh, amidst the crisis we are, we're living at, I, 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 I think um, there is a strong, um, strong need uh, of, 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 uh, of thinking rather than doing and creating, of course. Um, Usually, uh, of course, in the design processes, there is a there is a strong focus on the outcome, uh, the result. Why, why during uh, practice research, there is a stronger focus on the process. And in my experience, and uh, in in my work, when when we are creating artifacts um, or various <laughs> design outcomes, I'm not that interested uh, in the in the outcome itself, how how it looks like. Um, it's aesthetic. Rather, uh, what, what interests me are the, the processes and the relationships that were created through, through these, uh, mm, these processes. And, uh, and, and I think these, these are key and also the methodologies that we, that we critically, 
critically used th uh, through these uh, these uh, these periods, and and I I think Hina mentioned before longevity, which is uh, my mantra uh, in uh, in practice uh, research and in social design in general, because I I think it it p plays a, a very important key role. Um, how and how long do we engage with with communities and and what relationships we are building uh, these are much more important than the outcome itself and uh, i i think th these relationships are the, the the tangible should be the tangible outcome um yeah and that leads me very nicely on to your role there because we were chatting about it earlier for the panel starting mm. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, well, I, I mean, I've, after this morning's panel, it's really kind of like um, provoked some interesting ideas in my head because um, I, I'm really, um, I think, well, my research is about how to do, how to address these challenges that we face through collaboration. So I really don't see how you can do that without practice. That That's what it boils down to for me. Um, there's also this sense that as if you train as a designer, um, design is essentially, um, you know, when we boil it down, it's a service. and. And I can't go into a project without automatically understanding the problem space and wanting to address those challenges. So that, I mean, even though I might have tried to go in and observe and to, to draw theory from observations in an ethno ethnographical way, I, I, it's, it's actually practice has drawn me back into like, you know, more of an action research um, and, and more of a, a co-design space because, because it's, that's in me. That's like that's my drive. That's my um, my desire to kind of to find ways of dealing with these challenges that I can see are the challenges that we face before we can even start to find solutions. Because before we can even sort of de define what those problems are, we need to um, bring in different perspectives and understand one another. So it's almost like if we all want to reach this end goal of net zero or whatever the particular problem is and how it's been framed, we've got a pre-project problem that we need to, to face. We need to, we need to actually, when I was listening to Indy last night, that's also what it's about. It's about, we need to understand those different expertise, those different perspectives, and we need to define what those problems are together. We're, else we're solving the wrong problems to start with. Um, so, so that's why collaboration interests me so much. And that's why, and that's also why I, I have to have practice in there because it's, it's part of, you know, how, what design is essentially. Um, so, and, and, and I think the other thing that really this morning on the first panel that, that really just is what it, it, it spoke to me a lot is um, what Patricia said about being situated. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's, that's how can we learn about how to solve these problems unless, unless what we do is situated. And to give you kind of an example of that within one of the other projects that I work on is a textiles project. And, um, and the, sort of the, the, the sort of conception of the project is about local bio-based ecosystems. And it's a very ambitious, grand kind of idea that we could have you know, very local production. We can use local bio-based agricultural residues to make these um, textiles. And we can have it circular within this little ecosystem. But as a sort of abstract concept, that's one thing. And we can talk all day about what that actually means and what we could implement. But until you actually take that into a specific region, a specific context, and engage stakeholders in what that means, it completely, like you said about taking that game into the prison, it, it's a completely different thing. And you, yeah, that, that is an essential part of, of, of this whole, this whole uh, purpose that we have is to really be able to test our assumptions, not just as designers, but as a community of people who are involved in design, mm -hmm. in implementing change, in we, we, don't, we don't understand the innovation potential until we kind of throw that abstract net and put it back into the context. But Thank you. That, that leads me very nicely to our, to our next question, actually, is how do we balance the requirements to produce new knowledge as well as making contributions to practice or the so social situation or context. Um, and I think there's something there about social design and we've spoken a lot about humans, but you're also talking about ecosystems, so there's non-humans that, that we're also paying attention to. Uh, we're also talking about perhaps the hierarchies, Thomas, you spoke about between art and design and other disciplines. So engaging in a context um, like that. But I'd also sort of ask us, what is this drive for new knowledge you know, there was some tension there in the uh, earlier about that. Do, is there something that's called new knowledge? Are we the people who create that new knowledge? How wonderful are we that we're doing that? And who is this knowledge for? Who 
whose knowledge is it? I'm just kind of curious. So, Thomas, over to you first. <laughs> Have the next one. <laughs> um, well, um, I, obviously, I do think we do produce new knowledge, also relevant to re the research, design research community as well. We don't have to for forget about that, because that's also important. That as the field has matured, it's also about realizing that we build upon the work of others, and that was perhaps the challenge in the formative years of design research. I think there was John Zimmerman saying that. Design theory was like tooth brothers. Everybody had one, but didn't want to use the other, one, one another's. Um, and I think that was, yeah, putting it to the point. Luckily, we have moved beyond that. I think we actually, um, uh, there's a lot of new knowledge production happening. And also, I think it's about realizing that design research can actually also contribute with theoretical knowledge. We don't just import existing theories and imply it something happens to theory as it is involved into or embedded into practices and collaborations. Um, but I think the next thing is, is, is perhaps we also produce changes. But what is incredibly difficult at the moment is also to implement these changes into the organizations we work with, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in the public sector, because they often believe in cultures evaluations, which, and there's the hierarchy again, in prisons, there is cultural evaluation coming from criminology. We have incredibly difficult of proving uh, that we have the kind of impact that they're looking for, doing baseline studies and all of that. But we do think that we actually bring something to the visiting room, which is super important. Mm -hmm. And we are gradually also, think, managing to account for it in uh, cross-disciplinary in, in criminology journals. So, so I think there is an opening, as we have been talking about also, from yesterday, I think uh, that was pointed out clearly in the panel that it's, it's timely because there is a recognition that our practice research is, is uh, doing important work. I think you brought us really nicely together in saying that we're building our knowledge together because I think sometimes being in the field can feel very, you know, you can feel quite lonely in, in that and quite, you really challenge yourself with questions whether what, what you're doing is, is, is relevant. I think there's also something there that you're talking about, and I think Bori, you spoke about as well, that, that, that exists beyond you, that's intergenerational. The bench is there, it's still being used. Um, it's, it still has a relevance, even if the researcher or the, the designer's not, not in the room. Um, would you like to pick on, on some of the points that, that Thomas has made? Yes, um, certainly. I, 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 think, um, I think in these uh, situations, it's very important uh, to, to find the key people so you're not alone in those particular contexts. And that takes a, a lot of time. And, uh, and, 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 you, and it's also important for, for, for me, for example, to define my role as a practitioner, researcher, designer in that particular situation that is authentic. And then I, then I can find the key people. Um, we can call them stakeholders, we can call them uh, important uh, um, pers personalities who then define the process with you. Um, and, and I think it's very important that, you, that we think that, that and, and it also takes a, the burden off when we are talking about results, that it doesn't rely only on us. It's a, it's a, because of, of the participatory approach, uh, it's, a, it's something that, that a community is created, not necessarily me. And it also doesn't mm, belong to me. That's, that's also very, very important. Um, so, so then humility and, uh, and, and understanding uh, our role as practitioners in these situations are, are key. And, uh, I, um, I also just want to highlight that I think I think it's a very it, it's it's not easy to work uh, in this environment when there is a strong push on 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 results and uh, delivery, especially in the grant-based environment, and and there are some situations when 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 you you don't necessarily have a result that is tangible or it's, it's better not to have uh, anything, or there is a failure. And, uh, and I, 
I think that the current environment doesn't really address dead ends as well as it, it should need. We haven't really mentioned the words in terms of, we speak to our students about, about you know, experimentation, about play. We've spoken about importance and urgency, but you know, that idea of failing hasn't really kind of come up and it feels quite integral to what we're talking about. Rosie, you and not Jane. Yeah, because I think um, I think that um, I just I've just kind of been writing. It's, it's, it's an honest. It's, you've got to have an honesty about this, haven't you? And and it's not just about failing. It's about the discomfort that you're going to feel when you come into this space. It's 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 brave. You have to be brave as a, you know. There's none of this like celebratory aspect that you might have had that we've we've experienced in the past with design. You know, it really isn't like that. It's it's about acknowledging as well that it, it that you will feel uncomfortable that workshops are not gonna run perfectly, that people that people won't necessarily appreciate what you're doing all of the time, that you know, the person who appreciates it is most likely gonna be the person who's, who's coordinating the project, maybe, in my, in my instance. Um, it's not going to be, you know, they're not gonna automatically, the people who you're working with go, well done, you know, that's, you've done a great job. They, some people might, and you've gotta recognize the successes for yourself almost. And I think, yeah, I think that, that um, like you said, you, you yeah, you're not going to you're not going to get that same sense of appreciation that that um, that you that you might get if you were I don't know exhibiting in an exhibition or something. But I think that that's you take that as being a part of the process and acknowledging that that is you know you, that's, it's a balance. It's a balance be between feeling comfortable, achieving what you know that you need to do within that context, and having the buy-in from enough people to make it worthwhile. Yeah, I think it sounds very healthy that we don't have a sort of We've killed the design hero on the stage today. That sounds, sounds very, very healthy. Um, I, I know, Hannah, you have some thoughts, thoughts on this. So let's dip to that quickly. And I think we've got quite a few questions coming to us from online. Uh, we can't see the people, but they'll be gentle with us, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying how big or how much, but even if it's a one insight, that's new knowledge. So we must celebrate it. Uh, secondly, I feel, uh, for me, I think I would say the three C's uh, kind of exist in this uh, hierarchical space, if you're thinking about in terms of hierarchy, so that's collaboration, very, very important communication, and then collective intelligence, uh, because we work on the ground, so we're working with the people, so we need to be able to negotiate and navigate these spaces. Um, we design these spaces in a way, but again, thinking about the plausible, so is it, we think, we kind of think of it as a plausible space, and what are the possibilities, and then we kind of uh, look at the probabilities, but we can never know. Um, I remember very quickly a project in which I lost six months of my time. I came, that it was a PhD project. I came back, um, I got on the plane, it's an eight hour flight from Pakistan and I was like, I thought I was dying a slow painful death. But when I had my supervision meeting, the first thing my supervisory team after listening to me and kind of, you know, um, they, they do kind of become shrinks in a way, uh, giving me counseling and everything. They said to me, oh, that's, it's, it's excellent. And I, I just, I was shocked and I was like, what do you mean it's excellent? And they were like, now you know exactly what not to do. So I think it's very, very important when you're working on the ground to take your failures as also insights and kind of, and, and building that into your design process. Um, and also kind of thinking about um, working with disparate uh, people, networks, organizations, building communities, um, online, offline. I feel it's very important for us as um, practice researchers, practice-based designers, that we acknowledge uh, the weaknesses but I think we, coming from a design and creative background, we, we're kind of good at that because we, we, I think the most critical we are, are of our own selves. So, um, and I'm, I'm, excuse me for generalizing, but I feel that, you know, this criticality in a way helps build resilience um, within the researchers and then also transmit this. So it's kind of a circular process because right now we're in a very safe space. So we, we're talking to each other, we all understand the language, we all, all understand the terms we, we, you know, we're engaging with. But when we're working with cross-disciplinary, and I think Alison works quite a lot, I work a bit as well, it just kind of then becomes a lot about the vocabulary and creating this understanding and building this trust and relationship with people coming from different perceptions, different backgrounds, different values. Hence, hence the value of the tacit 
within the design process can never never be ignored from, from uh, my perspective. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna finish with this because I just kind of read it the other day somewhere where someone said that uh, we're the ones we have been waiting for, which kind of applies to uh, on-ground work where we work with communities, we work with ideas like empowerment, we work with ideas like alleviation, poverty alleviation, et cetera. But then how do, these are, these are huge spaces, so how do we navigate this? And how do we make these spaces actionable? actionable? Um, I had a lot of conversations with uh, Professor Gammon, uh, Lorraine Gammon, about uh, the ideas of objectivity and subjectivity. And she always quotes Bruno Latour, who says, uh, nothing is completely uh, objective, because at the end of the day, we are the ones who are making these decisions, um, be it about planning, be it about methods, be it about identifying stakeholders and engaging with spaces. Jasper, we have more for you for questions, please. We've got some hands in the room as well. Okay, so a question from Steffi. Uh, it's interesting to hear the interpretation earlier of art versus design outputs, um, which echoes the speculative de design debate. Is design research about accountability of interpret, or is design slash research, so it could be design or design research, I guess, um, about accountability of interpretation and what is accountability in practice based does design research in your experience? Maybe we could use some real examples um, just to briefly touch on that. Maybe the visiting room, Thomas, for you. Yeah, I would rather um, use some other examples. Um, some years ago, uh, colleagues and I were setting up a PhD course uh, because we were as uh, confused as the speaker in the last panel about the prepositions in, in, on, by, through, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so we thought there was a need to actually uh, provide um, PhD courses which were prying open the experiments and were giving a PhDs uh, methodological handles to sort of conduct that kind of work. And we thought the best curriculum would be other PhDs claiming that they were doing uh, research through design. And we looked through, I think we read 25, 20 plus PhD thesis, uh, theses, claiming all of them to belong to research through design. But man, when we looked at them, <laughs> that was quite varied. It was not just about accountability. Some of it was, but you also had people like uh, Otto von Busch, who's a fashion designer, who wanted to democratize the fashion industry by uh, inviting uh, communities in Istanbul and other, uh, other places in. And he ended up with a manifesto, a political manifesto for fashion design. So that is also an outcome. You had uh, a PhD in Polymi in Milano working on, you know, uh, redefining ethics uh, on, a, on, a, on an international human rights scale. So, so I mean, you could really see different kinds of outcomes and all of it we would claim um, belongs to design research but we just need some conceptual clarity of when it's one or the other and, and why is it one or the other. So, so I, guess, I guess what you're saying is that accountability is accountability in practice research is to ourselves as practice researchers but also to the people we're engaging with. They hold us accountable so we hold ourselves accountable collectively I think and through practice um, through the process, through the tacit, as, as through the system. Yeah, but also through the community. I think that the, you know, within the institution, within the research community, I think we're quite good at holding each other accountable <laughs> in a way. You know, we build our frameworks and we're very critical when people are not, um, you know, acting in a responsible yeah. manner. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think it's very closely linked. So we're at each stage as designers, we, we're critically looking at what we're doing and how uh, we're engaging participants. At the same time, we're also very um, open about uh, the communication with the participants within a design space. So I think that in itself creates accountability um, on, or within the on-the-ground projects. And um, 
So there's a question actually from the earlier panel, which I think is probably quite relevant to the conversation we just mm -hmm. had, we didn't get to earlier. Um, so from Nicola Morelli, one of the qu main issues I see in practice-based research is the impossibility of replicating the results and sometimes the processes of research. So my question is whether we should consider practice-based research as a sort of craftsmanship that implies that every result is unique or is there a perspective on repli replicability? Um, yeah. As chair, I, try, I will try not to. Yeah. So I know we I all are. Lots of mouths open, I think we yeah. all are. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it open to who wants wants to go go for it. Rosie. Um, well, I, sorry, yeah. okay. you go, you go, you go. You <laughs> I think go. we're all kind of. <laughs> I just want to say that that I think there is a very strong need of uh, conversations and communications between uh, practitioners and researchers doing the same thing. And, and I think this is, this, is a, this is a topic we don't, we can't talk enough, that there is so many similarities in our work and we are doing immense efforts to do almost the same. And of course, there are a lot of contextual, uh, mm -hmm. situational community uh, differences, cultural, and I could name more. But, but I think there, is, there, there should be more uh, intentions and work towards uh, the, the mutual understanding and, and, and collaborations and working together. So uh, the replicability uh, would require less work and more collaboration. We also have systems and process. Nancy Farris talks about systems and process, and we forget the design of systems as well as process. Mm. And there is a dialogue that actually holds those two things accountable. So you could set a system and then the process allows you to have a dialogue with the system that you that you put with the communities. So I, I, I feel that actually that difference is about a context in which it, it exists. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with the term replicability. I feel it's coming from, from a very science background, which is fine if you want to engage with it. But I think within arts and design, um, I would be more comfortable using the term knowledge exchange. Mm. Uh, for me, I think it's not about creating a model that can be completely replicable because we are creatives. We, we like iteration and reiteration and change mm -hmm. and disruption. And we, I would, for me, I think it would be more about um, a point of reference rather than a complete replicability um, of a process or an outcome mm -hmm. or a model. Rosie. Yeah, <laughs> I completely agree with you. But, um, but what I wanted to say is that, that we're finding that, that the thing about this is that we're finding that there's a great demand for this type of approach. And so all I would say is that I think there are part, there are aspects of what we do which we can draw up and kind of communicate and articulate and understand, which we can then use to teach and inform our teaching and build capacity in this area, because that mm -hmm. is fundamental to what we're doing at the moment, is that we need to build capacity. Um, and, and that's what I think the value is in trying to understand and articulate what those common um, methodologies are. Um, yeah, and yeah, and, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'll stop now. <laughs> I could go on. I've got, I've got tons of, yeah, I don't know where, where to go, but I think the gentleman there in the, in the stripes was first, and then I think Alison and then this one. I think Alison. Yeah. Hi, my name is Francesco Mazzarella, and I am a senior lecturer in fashion and design for social change at London College of Fashion here at UAL. I have a, a bit of a question or provocation, I don't know, maybe for Hannah or for others. Well, sometimes in this uh, panel, uh, the, we've been using a bit interchangeably the term participatory action research and practice research. So I wanted to ask what do you think is distinctive of action research or practice research? And then the second part of this is in sometimes I think uh, there are instances in which uh, practice research is not applicable to some types of uh, practices of design, especially when it's more immaterial, like in service design or design activism. And then also considering that often uh, in working in social design, which is the remit of this symposium, often we work, a key distinction is working with people. So I wonder, shouldn't we be talking about participatory, uh, participatory practice research rather than just practice research, which could uh, imply uh, the artist of the designer working uh, with materials and, uh, and processes on its own? Very complex, sorry. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> 
we okay. got a little bit on, on time. So, Hena, if yeah, I could so just pop to you, and I want to get make sure we yeah, get to so another so question before we wrap up. up. We could probably have a chat later as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think for me, I think I'm coming from my own uh, practice context when I'm talking about participatory research. And uh, when I and, and the distinction between action research and participatory research for me is that my participatory research practice engages actions, it engages activism, it engages uh, different sorts of um, uh, action-based objectives. But it's a combination of all. So I kind of define it as participatory. I use the term to define it as participatory research that engages people. Um, enables people to communicate or act in, 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 a, in a certain way, it enables me to communicate and act in a certain way. So that's, that's the answer for the participatory research. Uh, the second part was, sorry? <laughs> But I think that's also I think that's also part of the symposium. Yeah. I was just reminded by a report that came out here in the UK, I think in the 2014, uh, made by some of the people here in the uh, concerning design research. There was a definition saying that the so social design is inherently uh, participatory approaches to researching, generating, and prompting change uh, towards co collective or social ends rather than commercial objectives. So I think inherently in the de definition of social design, mm -hmm. participatory mm -hmm. approaches is appreciated as a way of working. Thank you. So. I, I think we have Alison. Okay, so. Really a comment on the previous question from Nicholas uh, Morelli and mm -hmm. about replicability. And I guess I, as a sort of, part anthropologist, I've never heard that question being asked in other disciplines. And I feel it's a it's almost like a it's like a slight falsehood that we have to be seeking replicability within design when there are many other or practice our practice research where there are many other disciplines which have forms of practice and they're not having to to sort of d defend about lack of replicability. And it's just as a as a comment really on on why why there is this almost insecurity around this? So, I, I think that's great. I think I think you're good uh, over there, and I'm I'm sort of running out, out of time. But I I think perhaps the one thing that we as a panel were discussing pre was really, and I think Anne, you touched on it in in the earlier panel, um, and Alison is what does confidence then look like to us? I think that's a really important thing for us to kind of hold as as a as a group in the room. And, and online, what would that confidence then look like? Hi, um, I'm Katie Hill. I'm um, I don't know, I'm not even going to say where I'm from. All, all sorts of places. Um, <laughs> just picking up on what Alison uh, just said. So I was thinking, like, we seem like maybe it's useful to just remind ourselves that we are work we're working in a hostile environment as creative researchers okay and there's two there's two kind of forces very significant forces in the uk at the moment acting against us one is um this the kind of dominance of the sort of scientific thinking in research and the other is the kind of cultural war on um, on on arts creativity culture the value of it um i do some lecturing at the university of wolverhampton they just announced last week that they are basically shutting down the design department there. They, there's just been an article in the press this morning from students and staff saying how this is part, you know, it's a part of a kind of um, an attack on the arts, on the opportunities for people in that region. It's a very kind of um, regional university that serves um, people who would not have the opportunity to access that kind of um, education in other places. So it's, so it's, you know, it's really, it feels really political and social much and part of the the, you know, the broader challenges that as a society we are operating within. So it's really to remind ourselves that we are, you know, that's like there, there's, there's a form of resistance needed, activism, 
um, as as researchers to be to be challenging this stuff. Um, and I think you know, for example, new knowledge for me, there's like there's nothing but new knowledge in design because no two instances of design are the same. I fully recognise Rosie's sort of thing of like I can't be in a space without being a designer. Probably coincidentally because we studied in the same place and with Guy as well. So there's something there as well about the kind of some of the knowledge networks that are sort of present here and that are maybe kind of surfacing some of those. But yeah, it's that, you know, and how how can we um what things do we have control of? So one one idea is, you know, how can we look to how can we look to other disciplines that are also um you know having to kind of resist and counteract other these these same kinds of forces how can we build those kind of um build that solidarity but also how can we i think there was there was something that said earlier about the sort of ins, you know the institutionalization of design and research how can we um how can we kind of take you know we are we are those institutions too like we're part of them are yeah. uh, okay really difficult <laughs> but like can we are there things that we can change certainly on the research side of the challenge about um about the, the you know the kind of the cultures of research of which we do have influence but we do you know we have people in the room are, who are you know heads of departments professors da, 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 you know we all, and we we all we do yeah so it's like what can we do to um, create solidarity between ourselves as a community, but also to smash all of the hegemonies, <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> but thank you for thank you for anchoring us back into the title of our which was the realities of doing this. Thank you for also being inspiring us that you know we all want to run out not for lunch but in revolt <laughs> after what you've said. Um, but also to understand that our agency, that we have collective agency, but sometimes we might be the symptoms of what we're actually seeing. And I'm afraid that brings us to uh, me saying thank you to the panel.